I induced different type of models of chronic inflammation in the liver. And it turned out that the, by chance, some of the models that I created turned on exactly pathways that have been identified in chronic hepatitis B and C virus replication, which was the expression of an inflammatory network called NF-kappa B signaling. And yeah, this is end. Funnily enough, these mice developed liver cancer, the mice that I generated without any genetic uh, tricks, just by transferring an inflammatory signature from a human into a mouse. And yeah, this is how everything got started. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. What is the state of the science around liver cancer diagnosis and treatment? Do you think it's um, accelerating? It's, it's a strong field? It's, a mess. It's, it's one of the biggest fields in medical research at the moment. This is, for example, best mirrored by the fact that all the journals that work on it have um, impact factors above 30. Okay. Journal of Hepatology has increased its impact factor in the last three years by 15. Mm -hmm. Hepatology, the same thing, gastroenterology, gut. Um, so uh, the, the biggest meeting, um, the European Association of Liver Disease, the ESL meeting, um, has 10,000 to 15,000 um, participants. Um, I, um, I had the pleasure to organize the scientific program this year in London. Um, and despite Corona, it, or like, we had like altogether more than 9,000 people at mm. site and I think similar amount of people um, online. And uh, the field is extremely strong because of course it is of enormous um, importance because every third American has a fatty liver. Um, so, you know, this, this uh, surpluses uh, chronic hepatitis B virus infected patients in the United States or Europe by, by large. Um, but of course, the problem um, to treat hepatitis B virus and C virus infected patients in Europe, in the US, but also in Asia is of course of, of highest importance. Um, when you think about you know what's going on in China at the moment, I mean you have hospitals that only deal with hepatitis um, uh, virus infected patients and liver cancer. Wow. Huge hospitals. I mean you go to cities that have 30 million uh, inhabitants and then you see these hospitals, which you would not imagine that there is a hospital for one particular tumor type. Dedicated. Uh, yeah, just dedicated for liver cancer because it is, you know, it's still you know causing um, more than a million deaths a year. Um, so, and, and um, it's massively rising now in, in, in Europe, um, may this be viral or of course, lifestyle related, so. Yeah, yeah. Are there exciting new tracks in the field of liver cancer? Yes, there are. Um, Similar to similar to maybe virus-induced liver cancer, immunotherapy is one of those, and um, so and it's remarkable. We published a paper in Nature last year where we have shown that most likely the etiology of the liver cancer patient to some degree dedicates the efficacy of response to immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. So if you have a viral infection, you respond very well. If you have a non-viral infection, not necessarily are you on the side of the good responders. I see. And that has implications of massive implications, of course, uh, wasn't taken up uh, that vividly, um, of course, in the in the field, because it was believed that uh, immunotherapy is the blockbuster. Yes. Um, but of course, and it will be the blockbuster and it is the blockbuster, but I think it has to be adjusted and equilibrated for uh, particular patient support. Immunology is uh, immunotherapy is, is also termed precision medicine? Yes. Yes. Well, I wouldn't say that, I mean, uh, precision medicine, um, I would be careful with using that term, but I, I would say stratification of patients. That's, I that's what I understand as precision medicine, so that you can identify an individual patient with its molecular and co let's call it immunological signature, mm -hmm. based on which you could group in, group this patient, him or her, in a particular treatment group, which would enable a better response 
uh, a better therapy efficacy and of course uh, longer survival of the patient. That's what I would understand as under precision medicine. We were talking earlier, and, and I wanted to go back to the diagnosis mm -hmm. of liver cancer, how difficult it is, and why is that, and how much progress is being made mm -hmm. in diagnosis? So to diagnose liver cancer, let's say in a, in a peripheral blood test, um, is not possible, at least not reliably possible at the moment. Of course, obviously you can already reliably um, diagnose a hepatitis uh, disease. And I think we are already now at the state by using single cell technologies, I speak about my lab, to use particular cell types to even diagnose the etiology and the severity of a particular hepatitis. But to predict or diagnose a tumor that may be, for example, by imaging is not detectable yet. Mm -hmm. So to detect pre-neoplastic lesions or yeah, that's actually what you would like to do, right? So once sure. a small tumor is on the rise that you could, uh, that it pops up and you could see it in peripheral blood, this at the moment is still not possible. I see. Your talk this week at the meeting is about the commonalities of various causes of yes. liver cancer. Um, are you surprised that finding more or less commonalities as you do your research? I think it's um, it's very interesting that there are some commonalities when it comes to the inflammatory pathways and some general pathological development. So in both diseases you have, may it be viral or non-viral, you have chronic inflammation, you have a chronic regenerative process because the liver is a regenerative organ, you have DNA damage that goes together with damage chronic damage of the hepatocytes and the regeneration processes. But in terms of quality, they are massively different. Mm. Still, at the end of the day, what comes out of uh, the tunnel is actually um, a liver cancer phenotype that, is, that couldn't be more complex and heterogeneous. So mm. it's very difficult to group. It's possible, but it's very difficult to group etiologies into particular matrices where you could say, okay, this genetic setup must be a virus-induced liver cancer. So that's not the case. Right. And so far, these matrices have failed to find their way into the clinic because exactly of that. Oh. And why is it heterogeneous? Because the cancer development is based on the sporadic regeneration and accumulation of DNA damage as a selection process in the liver mm -hmm. to develop cancer. So hepatocytes that accumulate by chance particular mutations will be selected for a particular pathway. Obviously, when you have a integration of your HPV genome into, a, I don't know, um, oncogen or in front of an in front of a of a promoter of a um, of a gene that has a strong expression. Yes. Um, oncogene promoter or something like this, then of course, you know, this changes the picture um, yes. on top. And then there will be some, let's say, guided ways towards cancer. But on the whole, very often you have a potpourri of sporadic um, mutations. And uh, obviously, um, also in liver cancer, as there must be rules as to whether there is a hierarchy of particular oncogenes and tumor suppressors, it is very clear that there are some tumors where you more often see particular parameters, particular mutations, because these are simply stronger in terms of, so they are, they are not, um, these are really drivers. Um, they're not passengers, they're really driver mutations. And that's what you see more often, but of course also the driver mutations can change the character of a tumor in a way that you know a particular treatment response does not exist anymore. What's the focus of your lab? The focus of my lab is to understand in sporadic chronic models that try to mimic human pathology mm -hmm. and in patient samples as well by doing clinical trials, how chronic inflammation induces cancer. Ah. And this not only holds true in the liver, it also holds true for the lung. And by doing so, we try to identify, I think that's our claim of fame, strategies by which we don't go for small molecules, 
um, inhibiting something in a cell, but by going for particular immune cells and trying to understand what they do, and then blocking specifically, for example, a pro-inflammatory function of a platelet. Yes. By which you could abrogate cancer development. And we did this um, in the past, in oh, patients and in mice. That's exciting. Yeah. Well, thanks for speaking with us. Pleasure.